so then to the agenda so first of all Vendor Capital, we are an early stage uh, SaaS centric uh, VC investing in companies uh, originating from the Nordics and Baltics. Uh, we like to enter uh, an investment at the stage where uh, you already have a little bit of revenue, you have some international customers, and that's typically when we, when we uh, you know, join your team, uh, of course, bring the money, uh, but then also very much help you align your company for for future growth and then naturally help you raise the further funding rounds uh, and and with that you know today uh, the topic is is building your blt foundation for very fast unicorn growth and our guest today is is uh kyle poyer from from overview and I'm sure neither OpenView nor, nor Kyle really need much introductions. Uh, OpenView is really uh, the uh, global uh, leader in the in the SaaS investment scene, and and Kyle is the VP of Growth at OpenView, and and very closely work together uh, with the OpenView companies on on really helping them be prepared for the growth. And and certainly Kyle is probably one of the most known product-led growth experts in the world. So very happy to have Kyle join us here today for the, uh, for the last uh, keynote of, of, of our, our SaaS camp. Um, with that, I think Kyle, we're ready for you to take over. Thank you for joining us and, and uh, let's kick it off. Cool. Well, and we have a quick poll here. Uh, asking is PLG already a key part uh, in your strategy? Uh, maybe we just see how many people have voted on that uh, to see where folks are in their PLG journey. So polls are still coming in. Uh, we have way over 50% uh, already applying PLG, 15% uh, saying no, not yet. And about the third um, somewhat doing it. Uh, we can check back to this poll a little later on as the results keep coming in, so. Great, so this is an audience that's already fairly familiar with PLG. A lot of them are doing it well, which is awesome. Uh, so I'll focus the talk on uh, how, to take, how to take your PLG strategy to the next level uh, rather than the PLG kind of 101 material. And uh, can folks see my screen all right? Yes. Awesome. Uh, so just to kind of set the stage, uh, if you think back to experiences buying software, even just a few years ago, it used to be really hard. Uh, from a buyer's perspective, you would spend weeks searching online for different solutions, reading reviews, reading white papers, maybe analyst reports, talking to uh, friends at different companies. And then you would you know, request a demo, get sent to an SDR who qualify you, uh, it might take even a couple of days before you heard from them. All that just to get a demo of the product. If that went well, you need to do more demos with more people. If you even you know, eventually liked the company, you then finally get pricing information with a proposal. And then you get into back and forth around legal and security and procurement um, and final budget approval. You know, all of this just to buy a product. You know, it might've taken six months from a buyer's perspective followed by a multi-month complicated implementation period to get the product working in your environment. And then all that was even before any end users were even using the product live. Uh, and so many software implementations were unsuccessful. Uh, and all of this you know, obviously took a lot of time for customers to see value and took time for vendors uh, to be able to uh, deliver uh, on the cost of acquisition. And we're seeing all of this is being flipped on its head, right? Uh, people don't have patience for this anymore, especially in, in today's post-COVID world. Today's software is just kind of showing up. If you think about Sneak and Datadog and Atlassian and DocuSign, um, it's just showing up from, in companies from small to large. And the dynamic is that end users uh, are going out and finding these products, implementing them, starting to you know, share them with colleagues, and then eventually going to their boss and saying, hey, we got to buy this. Um, the end users are telling their boss what to buy, not the other way around. 
And in OpenView, we consider this the end user era, uh, or end users are really an important constituent in buying software and not just that, that executive buyer. And the best SaaS companies have been recognizing it for a little while. You know, when you look at Atlassian's S1 filing from a little while ago, Dropbox's S1 filing, Zoom's, they talk about, hey, users drive the adoption and proliferation of our products. Bottom-up adoption is key. Uh, we grow through viral demand driven by individual users. Uh, but it's not just bottom up or B2C to B or freemium or the consumerization of IT. Really, at OpenView, the way we think about it is, you know, bringing that all together under this umbrella of product-led growth. And a lot of companies are pivoting uh, to PLG and to this end user era that had never done it before. And so one of the most successful examples is HubSpot, which is known for inbound marketing software. And they pioneer the approach of hey, let's go write dozens and dozens of downloadable eBooks. We'll require an email address and then we'll put SDRs on cold calling all of those people who've downloaded our books uh, to try to sell them HubSpot software. But then the CEO and co-founder Brian Halligan realized that's not how HubSpot was buying software themselves. They noticed everything they were buying started with a project in some part of the organization. A developer was tinkering with something on the side couple of salespeople were trying to be more productive. Marketers were trying to uh, increase the number of uh, visitors to their website. And ultimately these products would end up on the CIO's desk of like, hey, we're using this, we're seeing success with it, we need to, we need to buy it. And software buying's really been turned on its head and you need to be able to start marketing and selling to these humans or individual users and enable them uh, to put the product to work for you. And this can be complementary to the top-down motion, uh, but I think it's, it's, it will be increasingly important to develop this muscle going forward. So as I said, at OpenView, we see product-led growth as how you adapt to the end user era. Our definition, uh, and OpenView actually coined the term back in 2016, is that product-led growth is an end user focused growth model that relies on the product itself as the primary driver of customer acquisition, conversion, and expansion. And this doesn't mean you know, marketing goes away or that sales goes away. It means that, that just there's a different mentality of how you uh, acquire customers. And it's taking things that would normally be done in a very manually intensive way, like outbound cold calling to generate leads and trying to find product solutions, which it turns out products are better at, at delivering a great customer experience at scale and doing it with a low cost. Because once you've built the product, uh, there's very little additional costs. And so what we're seeing, companies that have embraced a PLG model being able to grow faster uh, as they hit scale and, and much more efficiently. Um, so being profitable, break even, or have a, have a low cost of acquisition. Calendly in our portfolio uh, recently reached $70 million in ARR, and they spend almost no money on marketing and very little money on sales. In fact, they have only a handful of of AEs, and that's because of their PLG model. And I, I know, you know, you might look at this and say, hey, okay, this is, this is fine for Slack and Dropbox and Zoom, right? These are, you know, cons consumer -y products. Uh, but what I'd call out is we're even seeing ServiceNow, which is one of the most enterprise companies there, there is. Their average contract length is three years. They, their average deal size is over 100,000. Even ServiceNow is going all in on PLG. So you see this, for example, one of their job postings. Um, they say that they want to go after site reliability engineers and app developers because they believe these are the true guardians uh, of distributed systems and, and architecture. So essentially, they're trying to go after the end user for their product rather than just that executive buyer for ServiceNow. And you, you can also see here, they're they built out a whole product management team working to build the next generation of software products and embracing a true PLG model. So if ServiceNow can do it, uh, I think many others could, can do it as well. A few of the early uh, efforts that they have, I think you'll see they've got a developer website where you can sign up and start building. Uh, and it's free to sign up. Uh, they say that you can build your first app in minutes and they're really enabling the, this developer persona to uh, see success with the ServiceNow product before asking them to pay that 100K plus. Another thing that they're doing to, to kind of take this a step further is that they're even using the product for top of funnel marketing. And so they've taken common use cases or apps that their customers have built um, and they're turning this into templates 
which make it easier for new customers to try out the product. And they're great for marketing, right? These are great landing pages that someone could search for and, and stumble upon. An end user probably isn't searching for a process management software or IT service management software, but they might be searching for, hey, we need a vaccine administration management. This is a new motion for us. We don't want to be able to build this ourselves. We won't get to market fast enough given COVID. Oh, ServiceNow has a product for that. That's awesome. And so they have this whole store, app store, uh, that is super fast for people to see, see uh, product value. And zooming out, when we look at and work with companies adopting a product-led growth model, we see four different steps. And I'll walk through each of these, but it starts with appealing to end users, making sure those end users can try out the product and see value in it before being asked to pay for it, uh, making sure those customers are successful and investing in the health of your customers before being overly aggressive and layering on sales. Uh, so PLG isn't anti-sales, but it's about bringing on the right kind of sales experience for the customer. Uh, and then finally, in this model, you know, you're doing everything at a much different scale than you would uh, in a traditional top-down executive uh, level motion. And you have to measure really everything, product interactions uh, in particular, and your traditional sales and marketing tech stack uh, start to look really different. And so I'll walk through what that, what that means. So for the first one, appeal to end users. If you think about what an end user cares about, it's very different from that executive. And so if you think about like your website, what's the header kind of statement that you use, it's probably around an executive pain, right? So for CRM or for, for a sales persona, a, C, a CRO really wants to manage their sales pipeline, make sure there's transparency, make sure they can guide their team um, to, to, uh, to ultimately hit that pipeline number. The end user, that sales rep, doesn't really care about that same thing. What they care about is, hey, I hate scheduling meetings. It hurts my productivity. Or it takes a really long time to just upload my notes into Salesforce and keep Salesforce hygiene. This is taking me hours and hours a week. There has to be a simpler way. And so you want to find this end user pain and really speak to it and address it in PLG. And then that end user pain eventually ladders up to executive level pain, which is also where sales comes in to sell that, that broader solution. Uh, you'll even see in the, in the sales uh, space, there's a new company called QuotaPath that uh, you know, takes this for commission tracking. And so while most commission tracking or quota management software are Multi-month implementations, extremely complicated, extremely expensive, hard to uh, adjust. Quotapath actually offers free solutions for end users, individual reps that wanna just track how they're doing against their commission plan uh, in a really easy way. And then they can sell to that head of sales ops, head of rev ops uh, later on as they have uh, people adopting their product. And you might think of this as, you know, annoyance. Uh, end user pain doesn't, you know, have an ROI attached to it that's as tangible uh, as, as an executive level pain. So an end user pain, you know, you could even say it's millennial whining. I'm a millennial, so I think I can say that. <laughs> the expense reports, it's, I hate expense reports. I mean, it's so annoying uh, to have to keep my receipts, fill out manually all of the details about them, scan them into a system and then send that off to someone. Why can't I just take a photo of my receipt or forward an email uh, and have, have the system just automatically capture the data I need? Uh, or uh, Slack, I hate internal emails. It's really complicated to figure th something out as a team. I wish I could just message my team members. And this is even happening in spaces where you would not traditionally expect PLG. Um, and so I think Sneak has done an amazing job in the security space, recognizing that while uh, the security teams and the CISOs are normally the main buyer for security products, developers are an incredibly important constituent in security. But for them, there's a lot of pain that comes with security. So they see security as a force that's slowing them down because they're trying to take control of their uh, software development pipeline, they want to release uh, new software quickly, and they do all this work only to be slowed down and stopped by the security teams. And so Sneak allows them really uh, simple solutions to take control of their products. Uh, and then security teams actually also love this because this means better security hygiene uh, for their entire company. 
And when you're appealing to end users, you know, it starts with speaking to their pain, but you also need to uh, set your product up in the way an end user wants to experience it. So imagine that it, like from a consumer perspective, you wanted to start using Uber and you had to request a demo, talk to someone, they'd send over a contract, um, and then you know, you'd have to implement Uber for yourself, you get trained on it. You probably wouldn't go through that work of, of downloading Uber. People want to just sign up, ideally with credentials they already have. So with their GitHub account, with Google, with Microsoft, have click through terms and conditions, automated onboarding that's in the product itself, documentation uh, to help them get started, a knowledge base to go uh, be, get, get support if they run into issues, uh, bots to answer questions uh, real time in the app, and then a whole community of users um, who are helping them discover new, new ways of using the product. And one thing I'll call out is that there's also leads to a different way of reaching folks, right? So with a traditional B2B SaaS environment, your marketing channels are like trade shows, they're webinars, uh, they're, relative, they're outbound, cold calling, they're pretty expensive cost of acquisition channels and they're aimed at reaching this really small community of executives uh, at a company. In an end user era, the benefit you have is you maybe have 10, 20, 30 times the number of potential people who could be using your product versus an executive product. But this also means you have to find scalable ways of reaching those users. So there's a blessing and a curse to it. And you're normally looking to optimize around word of mouth and virality, uh, which comes it, from having great user experiences that people wanna share with others and having collaboration in the product. So the product literally becomes a marketing channel. Uh, doing well on Google, so SEO, especially specific product SEO where you get found in the moment that user is experiencing their pain and trying to solve for their problem. And then another one I'll call out that actually HubSpot doesn't do great on here uh, are partners, including third-party app stores or other selling uh, solutions to the, to the same buyer type. And I'll walk through these specifically. And so virality and word of mouth is an awesome place to start because uh, it's essentially free growth. Uh, a couple of examples to share. One is Calendly. I already mentioned them. You probably have seen a Calendly link. Uh, it's a, the predominant channel for which they grow is you know, when you download Calendly and, and send your Calendly link to someone else to schedule a meeting, uh, they can just put in their email address or actually it's pre-populated for them and immediately sign up for a free Calendly account. And so their existing users are doing the work of sharing Calendly with other people. Uh, and while you know, there might not have an external use case for your product, uh, you can think about internal virality as well. So spreading the product throughout other people within, your, your own, within the own uh, company that you're selling to. And so at Figma, they have a lot of great collaboration around design and being able to invite people uh, I think Slack, many people know Slack would not be a fun product if you were the only one using it. Users actually want to invite other people. But I think even from, a, from your perspective, Slack is a great channel for adding virality, right? So if you have a Slack integration and people are downloading it, using it for free and can tag other people in Slack, these other people within that company are discovering your product. Uh, and so that's a kind of quick way to add collaboration and virality in. On the SEO side, I think Zapier is an amazing example to learn from. And so Zapier, uh, as you probably know, is an integration platform connecting different apps. And the end user is not searching for an app-to-app -app integration platform um, or you know, platform as a service product. They're experiencing an everyday frustration like, hey, I want to connect my Typeform account and my HubSpot account. Specifically, I want to be able to add a HubSpot contact or create a HubSpot contact when I get a new entry on Typeform. And so Zapier tries to get found every time someone is experiencing that specific pain point. So they have hundreds of apps and they have landing pages for every app that uh, is eligible for Typeform or for, uh, for Zapier. They have landing pages for every app to app integrations like Typeform plus HubSpot. And then they even have specific content around the popular ways that you can use the products to so specific workflows. And then that links directly to the product where, hey, if this is what you're trying to do, you can go do it in the product and get to, and see that work really, really quickly um, and for free. And so 
Zapier is normally getting found before Typeform and before HubSpot uh, get found when enough people are experiencing these challenges. And then a kind of a bonus thing from my standpoint is they're able to look at what, which of these landing pages is performing best, where are their users most successful in the product and double down from a marketing standpoint on these specific use cases and jobs to be done that their customers have. So they can really you know, go double down in this specific space if this is performing well for them. And they now generate over 7 million visitors every month and more than half of their visitors come from organic search. And it's because of this uh, product SEO strategy. I think uh, sidecar products are a great way of, of doing this as well. And, and this is a great way too of dipping your toe into PLG if you don't have a PLG strategy already. But before HubSpot had freemium products, they had a website creator where you'd put in the name of your website, the URL, and they give you scores on the website performance, mobile friendliness, SEO, and security. And they'd even give you recommendations on how you can improve your website. The benefit then is, hey, all of these ways that you can improve are things that HubSpot can help you with. And so uh, this became extremely popular. They've actually graded more than 4 million websites as a free product that's kind of go viral. Um, and this had an amazing link to what their paid product did. So I think these sidecar product ideas are a great way of starting to go after a PLG strategy and then an end user focused strategy, even if your product itself isn't ready uh, to go fully PLG. And then a final one that I'd share that I just don't, I think is underappreciated right now is third party audiences. Um, and so your end users might be spending a lot of time in other apps. Uh, I think the Shopify app is the most prominent example uh, for, for obvious reasons. They have over a million merchants who were generating more than 60 billion in merchandise value. And their app store now has 4,000 apps. And you see some apps are basically taking products that you know, already exist, right? Like email marketing, which is Klaviyo. We have so many email marketing software companies, but Klaviyo has managed to uh, raise a Series C at a $4 billion valuation. They're north of 100 million ARR reportedly all by focusing specifically on the Shopify ecosystem and Shopify merchants. And you know, they're getting found when these merchants are trying to, uh, uh, trying to grow their business. Yotpo is another example. Uh, they're essentially a unicorn in the review space uh, for Shopify. And you'll see a number of other companies like Postscript uh, in our portfolio that are going after this opportunity. So it's a don't, don't ignore these third-party marketplaces. Uh, they're increasingly important. The next step is that price comes after value, right? So you want to be able to get your new users to solve that pain point that they came in trying to, to, trying to solve before you ask for, uh, for them to start paying you. So we're seeing the rise of a lot more freemium, free trial, and free product strategies to do this. One example to share is Slack. And so uh, Slack on their website, uh, it's, hey, this is where work happens. Here's what we do. Just type in your email to get started. Uh, so it's super easy call to action, uh, free to use, not trying to, uh, not trying to even oversell you, just get you into the product to see value in Slack. And then as Slack goes from something that a, you know, a team is using to a few teams to the entire organization, what happens is that uh, you eventually uh, find that while they don't make it, they don't charge you for adding users. So you can add as many people as you want. Eventually Slack goes from this kind of nice tool that people are using on the side to where really important work is happening and important information is living. And that's when you hit the, uh, they're essentially their paywall where the amount of storage that they'll, uh, they'll maintain. And so when you hit, hit that kind of switch, you've seen value in Slack, you know how, it, how useful it is. You don't want it taken away and you are extremely motivated to pull out the credit card and pay for it. And so in fact, Slack's free to pay conversion rate is amazing, even though their free product is extremely generous. Um, it's because they're monetizing at that point that someone is seeing value. And so in a PLG motion, some sort of free offering is, is table stakes. You'll see a free trial is the most common. And this is from OpenView's uh, annual SaaS benchmarking survey. So 74% of companies that say they have a PLG strategy have a free trial. 38% have a freemium model. If you do the math, uh, it's more than 100% have some sort of free offering and some do both freemium and free trial. 
some other tactics are a little less common or less mainstream yet. So self-service buying uh, is only adopted by 61% of folks. So you don't necessarily need to go all the way through to a self-service checkout and purchase experience, as long as there's a free version to initially get started and see success. Uh, product qualified leads are not as widely adopted, uh, adopted either. And people are starting to really invest in growth teams to accelerate their PLG motion. One question that comes up to me a lot is, hey, should I do a free trial or a freemium motion? Uh, on here, uh, we actually did some research around it. Uh, our annual product benchmarks was launched uh, last June, where we looked at the funnel from folks who said they had a freemium motion and a free trial. What we found is that freemium uh, led to more signups. So there were 6% conversion from a website visitor to uh, getting into the product versus 4.5% conversion rate in for free trial products. And so freemium really opens up that initial base of users, but there's lower conversion from free to paid. And I think a lot of why this happens is there's no initial urgency to convert. And then probably some people have overly generous uh, freemium versions. But what happens is freemium products tend to have a longer tail in conversion. So in a free trial, if you don't convert within your trial period, you're probably never gonna convert. In freemium, if you don't convert within 30 days, if you're still using the product, you could convert after 60 days, 90 days, 120 days. So it takes a little longer to see those conversions. Uh, and that's where you really focus on making sure those people are still seeing value because they will eventually convert. Uh, and so in my mind, freemium is, is a better long-term play, especially if you uh, have invested in, in making folks successful with your product. And then you can play around with where that right paywall is, but you have a bigger base of people that are using your product, seeing value, inviting other people for free that you can then convert. Whereas a free trial, uh, it's more of a, of a river. You're kind of bringing people in and then you lose them and, or you convert some. Uh, but I think the, the best model actually is to find a way to combine the two. And so I love uh, combining freemium and free trial so that you really get the best of both worlds. Calendly in our portfolio does this. Uh, they default you to the pro plan, uh, which has all of their kind of premium features. And they do that for 14 days. After the 14 days, you, you uh, go back to the free version. And that helps with discovery, right? So you might not realize all the things that you could do with Calendly, but if you have 14 days to try it out, you're gonna discover those different things. And then you don't want them taken away. And so there's some loss aversion effects and people convert after that trial because they, they've seen value, they, they like these things. Airtable also allows you to uh, try out the pro version of their product for free uh, when you're starting out with Airtable and then they downgrade you to the, to the free version. And what, one final thing I'd add is that uh, while this does work great for products where you can see value pretty quickly, ideally like within minutes, uh, friction isn't necessarily an excuse to get your products. And the majority of companies with a free offering say that there is some friction uh, to starting to use their products. I think it requires a lot more finesse and effort to try to figure out how to reduce that friction or support your, your folks uh, to kind of go through those hurdles. Uh, but that to me is not a valid excuse. I mean, if ServiceNow can do it, I think you can find a way. So the third, uh, uh, a third area of product-led growth is that customer success comes before sales. So PLG is not anti-sales, but it's bringing on sales at the right time and for the right customers. I want to share a quote from one, a really successful uh, developer-centric PLG company around how they approach this. And for them, it's all about offering that right type of experience to the right customer at the right time. So they have, they have tons and tons of signups under their free tier. And as soon as someone signs up, they start to look at two different criteria. One is fit. So that's like, hey, is this a customer that is a, at a larger company in an industry that's a really good fit for us in a, in a market or region that's a good fit for us? And then also their usage level. And so for them, uh, if usage reaches a certain level and fit reaches a certain level, that's a trigger that they should start to have uh, a commercial conversation with that customer. If usage is not at a certain level, but fit is really high, they might proactively engage you know, a sales rep or a customer success person as well. So that, but it's a different kind of experience, right? It's more about helping them discover and start to figure out how to implement the product rather than a commercial conversation. 
and if it is low, they're really not going to invest a ton of uh, of human effort, but they will try to leverage uh, email campaigns or in product experiences to help that customer increase their usage. So that's much more of a self service experience. What I uh, would say is that you know this is this notion of using product data to help selling. Uh, which you know, is kind of called product qualify leads or PQL methodology, is still not common. Uh, only about 23% of folks say that they're tracking PQLs and their funnel conversion. And so to me, what you're essentially looking at is uh, setting up instances in the product that you would want to use as a signal that that person uh, should get a, a higher grade of experience, right? So maybe it's, hey, they just implemented a really sticky integration or, They've clicked to try to implement an integration and failed. They, it might need some extra help. Or they've invited more than 10 users, which is a signal that, hey, this is a product where they're seeing department-wide value or there's a you know, bigger use case here. Or maybe they've actually, in the product, uh, clicked on a form to go contact sales because they want to have a conversation. So it's essentially an inbound product-qualified lead from a, from a user. You want to be setting up these different points and experimenting with what leads to the best conversion rates, where is the right time to layer in uh, a, a person, and whether that person should be a salesperson or customer success or support to be able to really make sure that buying experience and that user experience is, uh, is ideal. And that, you know, from, from your standpoint, you have the best use of resources. And I wish I could say there was like a one size fits all where everyone is doing, you know, there are these best practices that everyone can apply, but the reality is that this needs to be customized for your target customer uh, and your specific product. And then I just want to add a lot of sales in a product led growth uh, business is more about customer expansion. And so where you already have someone trying out your product, using it for free, maybe paying for it as part of a team, and you want to you want to expand that account. And so Zoom, in fact, says. 55% of customers who spend over 100K started with one free user. Now, from a sales standpoint, they probably weren't doing a traditional sales process where they were demoing Zoom to all of these people that were already using Zoom, right? They were finding who is the most senior stakeholder we have who already has a Zoom account? How do we get on their radar and partner with them uh, at, to, to try to get broader adoption? So it's more working with your existing users and based on what, how they're already using the product, educating them about ways to see more value in the product, arming them with collateral to help overcome objections, because you, you and the customer have a shared goal. You, you are seeing success with this product. You want to see it more widely adopted. And it's a much less antagonistic uh, sales conversation with the customer. One tool that I find really helpful as part of this is what I call a patient zero analysis, which has taken on some new meaning with COVID, uh, but you're looking at, uh, you're kind of taking previous accounts that started for free uh, and seeing what their experience was like over time. So who was the first user? Who was the second user? Uh, what was their use case? What features in the product did they add value? And trying to say, hey, these are the characteristics that our most successful customers did uh, that led to them being successful. Uh, and here were bottleneck moments where, hey, if we had changed the experience earlier on, we could have accelerated this. Uh, and so at a data dog in our portfolio, they might say, hey, really successful customers integrated data dog with their IT alerting system, because that way they could go from monitoring to resolution. And that way, more people are kind of discovering Datadog within their environment. And so Datadog might then take an insight like that and try to get more and more of their new signups to be doing that activity because they know that's a leading indicator that someone's going to grow. And the final thing is that you want to measure everything. And so in a PLG environment, you have a lot more users. Uh, you have a lot of granular product data. Um, and that's going to be an extremely valuable source of information to optimize every different thing that you're doing uh, and uh, ultimately kind of consistently grow the product funnel over time. So the first thing is setting up a, a PLG tech stack. And so I think one, one way I think about it is like, what's the analog with the old tech stack to the new tech stack? 
So before you had a CRM with your system of record. Now the system of record are, are product analytics, right? You want to say, hey, what are our users doing inside the product? How does that ladder up across an account? And so tools like Pendo, Amplitude, and Mixpanel are extremely uh, popular uh, to solve that problem. Or in the old world, you might use a gong for call recording to be able to get visibility into uh, the status of where you are with conversations and to coach your sales reps to, to deliver better conversations. In the new world, it's more about session recording. So you wanna monitor with real-time videos what your users are doing in the product. And so you can say, hey, this person spent 30 minutes in the app, they abandoned, they've never come back. What did it look like from their standpoint? And that'll help you design new experiences or say, oh, hey, we need to add docs here, or we need to uh, make it a lot easier to find how to do X, Y, Z, because people seem to be uh, not, not able to discover that on their own. Dialers to engage reps, or uh, for reps to engage with customers, become in-app chat and in-app guides. And so some of this is with bots and some of this is with people, uh, but you're using tools like Intercom, AppViews, and WalkMe. Uh, contract management and kind of invoicing and CPQ become more of self-checkout tools. So uh, self-service payment and checkout through tools like Stripe, Chargebee, and Recurly. And then finally, uh, when in a traditional environment, you might do win-loss interviews with uh, customers. In this new world, you're doing constant user testing with people in your target market to get real-time feedback around your application. And so you might use tools like user testing uh, for offsite testing and more qualitative testing, tools like Optimizely for A-B testing on your site or Userly for surveys in the application. And then when you, so once you have this data, you know, what are you going to do with it? What to me, one of the most important metrics you want to look at is uh, user activation. And this is part of your, essentially your uh, product stages that a customer goes through. So it might be, hey, you have a sign up, someone verified their email. And then to me, this next key moment is activation, which means that they are doing the initial signals that they've been able to solve the problem that they came to you for. So this is normally something that's fairly easily achievable, mostly acts as a filter of, hey, who is a serious user? And uh, how do we know that someone's like shown signals that they've seen value in the product? Uh, it's normally something completed quickly within the first week uh, and that folks who do this have better outcomes. So if you do this, you are much more likely to keep using the product and you're much more likely to convert and purchase. So at Accountly, this is, they're trying to get new users to schedule five meetings in their first week or at Slack, it's trying to get someone to invite their team members and have three plus users within an account return on two days in their first week so that they're starting to show signals of, hey, multiple people are using this and it's sticky, they're coming back to it. And just for, for benchmark purposes here, uh, I've done a bunch of interviews and uh, com had conversations with some of the leading premium PLG companies. Uh, the average activation rates we saw were about 20 to 40 percent and the average conversion rate was around five percent here uh, i think one thing i'd call out is that for single user products activation rates tended to be higher so they tended to be on this order and then for multi-user products we're trying to get teams to get activated rather than just individuals uh, they tended to be over here and i do think even if your product is individual centric like a calendly I do recommend having multiple activation metrics, one for individual and one for team, uh, because ultimately you want people to be bringing on multiple folks in their organization. That's what's going to lead to stickiness, better retention rates, and more expansion versus if you get stuck with a single user. Uh, and you can do a lot in the product to guide folks to activation and to increase this rate. And so uh, Airtable, I think, is a great example. So this is what I saw when I signed up. And they really like hitting you with the activation event, which for them is setting up your first base. And so they have pre-populated this with really popular bases uh, that, are, that are common. They have a ton of like templates and guides to try to figure out what are the best ones for you. Or you could add one picking from their library or, uh, or searching uh, or create, creating one on your own. They're also, uh, pre-populating a guide that's been shared with me from, from someone else in my organization. And even though this is a freemium product, uh, they're creating urgency by putting me in the pro trial and saying, hey, you've got 10 days left. 
and have a really clear upgrade button here. Collaboration is important. So they're not just trying to get individuals to activate, they're gonna get teams. So that's where they kind of highlight these other bases and they really try to push you to, to share the product up here and try to invite friends. I think one of the things I notice when I look at new products is that actually sharing the product with others is not super easy to do. It might be hidden behind three or four clicks. Uh, you wanna make that front and center and emphasize the benefits of collaboration. And then finally, uh, they, uh, they've kind of taken this a step further and even gamified the experience. So they offer uh, credits, account credits when you invite friends or coworkers. Uh, and they have some other ways that they, they bring gamification in just to make it a little easier uh, to use the product. And something I'd share is that when I did this, I didn't actually set up a base. And so they gave me an onboarding rep. Uh, they probably saw my title. And uh, after you know, a couple of days, they sent an onboarding rep who emailed me offering to help you know, a one-on-one -on -one session to set up my first base. Uh, and so that was, you know, not trying to make it a commercial conversation, but recognizing that if someone doesn't see value in the product, uh, humans can kind of help them get there and that will lead to the right outcomes in the future. And then finally, you know, you need someone to be doing this, to be uh, running these experiments, to be op making improvements uh, to, to the product. And to me, uh, when we look at, at teams, having a dedicated growth team or even just a growth person uh, corresponds with much more uh, frequent experimentation within an organization. And this is where you're really gonna be able to constantly improve that, uh, that flywheel and growth is like the RevOps function essentially in a traditional uh, business. So I guess just, just wrapping up, uh, you know, we're seeing more and more companies go PLG. Uh, PLG is, is the, uh, uh, is the leading kind of strategy behind these successful companies. Uh, and they're talking about it in their S1 filings and their earnings call. Even just this year, I've been noticing uh, more and more companies offering freemium versions like GoDaddy for the first time, they were founded in 1997, JFrog, uh, GitHub launched a freemium version for Teams. Uh, companies are really going all in around this investment area. And more and more companies uh, that are PLG are, are IPOing. In fact, it's now about half of the new IPOs are from PLG companies and they're performing even better post IPO. Uh, and so, you know, we are pretty bullish that the end user era is here and PLG is the right way to uh, attack this opportunity. And uh, if you want, want to follow more uh, around the latest and greatest of PLG, I invite you to follow me on, on LinkedIn, uh, I you know write pretty regularly about it, and uh, I'll take some some questions at the end here too. Very good, thank you, thank you very much, Carl. Excellent data, excellent examples. Uh, very very highly appreciated. Uh, there aren't too many questions online, so maybe I start with a uh, fairly high level question. So, uh, how would you? Is there some way to kind of define that what product? kind of fits in the BLT model better than, than other product? Is there a price level? Is there some kind of you know, identification of this product fits and this doesn't fit or, or does it really apply? Can you apply it on, on any type of product? I mean, I personally believe it can be anywhere. I mean, if you see ServiceNow or companies like OutSystems doing it, uh, it can be pretty broadly applicable, but the best, uh, the best fits are really developer products. So developers especially hate talking to a sales rep. They just want to try something out uh, themselves. So you'll see in the developer space, almost all of the leading products have some sort of PLG angle to them. Uh, if you're selling more to an SMB space, your user and buyer are probably the same person um, and your deal sizes are probably going to be lower where people are comfortable putting it on a credit card. Plus, you can't afford a huge cost of sale. So I think it's almost critical if you're selling to a small business customer. Uh, and then finally, I'd say where it's going to be not as applicable is if you don't have an end user value proposition. Like if your value is really tied in the whole company is using the product and the executive sees the value and not the end user, uh, that's where uh, you, uh, that's where it's a lot harder to see value with PLG. That's where if you wanted to start moving into it, I'd say you'd want to start with these sidecar opportunities like the website grader, where you can uh, you can start to like find out kind of like sm small scale 
productized solutions that reach this uh, person? Uh, maybe somewhat in the same space, but how about, do you see it possible to apply somewhat a hybrid strategy where maybe certain segment, certain customer size is kind of sales led while the other segments are, are, are you know, product led or, or does it just create a huge mess in a company? Yeah, you can certainly do that. I'd say it ends up being a little bit of a gray area uh, because some of the companies that are in the wrong segment might just want to prefer the product-led path. Uh, but that is a, that's a certainly a viable path to move in that direction. So we'll sometimes see as companies saying, hey, we want to maybe move our sales team up market, have them focus on large enterprises where there's a better uh, cost per acquisition, better retention, whatever. And then the PLG motion will be to serve the lower end of the market. And eventually, but I think that the, um, the key things are make sure that there's not adverse incentives between the sales motion and the PLG motion. Uh, I think that sales reps might really react negatively if they're getting way fewer leads now than before, or if they're working with an account and then that account somehow converts via self-service even though they're like, I worked for months on helping them see value and I don't get credit for it. And then I think the other thing is like, if you do that, just make sure that the PLG experience isn't overly SMB focused because you could hurt the brand reputation, right? An enterprise could sign up and you could say, hey, uh, this, they, they could say, hey, this looks like an SMB product. This doesn't look like it's for me. And when you've lost that lead, you've really lost them for a while. And so just trying to view this, this element as, hey, while it might be in theory meant for these different segments, we need to build some kind of feedback loops and collaboration so that uh, we're not missing out on opportunities. And I guess it really takes a modern sales force to understand that uh, driving PLC into the market will then, over a longer period of time, create very great leads for them to go after when the accounts are ready once, once the BLT has kind of done its magic and gotten those uh, customers to a level of, of actually, you know, accepting a sales call, I guess. Exactly. Well, like one example in our portfolio is uh, ZipWhip. So they launched self-service back last spring and they're now converting three times as many new customers a day as they did before uh, with the same size sales team. And so for them, the sales team is moving more mid-market um, or is able to take folks who maybe bought self-service and then they want to expand beyond self-service, uh, which are much easier sales conversations to have. And so they're able to focus on larger customers. They don't have to kind of do demos with companies that are ultimately going to pay 30 bucks, uh, but it's still required, you know, building out a marketing engine to still be able to feed leads to the sales team and keep them engaged so that they didn't feel like this was taking taking their job, but that it was actually helping helping them. Goes back to lead scoring and making sure that you you pick and choose the right guys to talk to. Uh, there's a there's a question from from Kai Leppanen on uh, uh, you know measure everything when implementing PLC. So uh, how long or or how do you define if you're on the right track? when you're implementing PLC and you, you start getting kind of measurements and data, how do you define that you're on track and not off track of, of really becoming PLC? Yeah, and so to me, uh, what you'd wanna do, I mean, and I think about like this, from this person's standpoint, it's probably, they're probably thinking about starting to implement PLG as having this self-service kind of free offering that people can get started with. And you know, what happens when you kind of roll that out? I'm looking at time to value and what percentage of users reach activation. And so if you start to, if you create even just a hypothesis of a moment of activation, right? Like, uh, like Calendly is scheduling five, five meetings. There might be some other activation metrics they could have used, but then that was like the most obvious. For SurveyMonkey, it's like, hey, you created a survey. Um, and so you just define one that you think is realistic. And if you're getting fewer than say 10%, 15% of new signups to do that, there's probably some, some kind of negative signal there. And that's really where you want to focus before sending a bunch of traffic to your PLG opportunity. Uh, and so that's where I would look at, hey, this is a really early signal of whether it's working or not. I think another thing what, that's interesting about activation is that 
uh, like any marketing efforts that you're paying for, it's, it can be a while before you see the results from a conversion standpoint, but a activation has a really strong correlation with conversion. And so with activation, you know, within a week, uh, if someone is likely to convert. And so you actually can like optimize your marketing campaigns a lot better uh, if you optimize on a activation basis rather than a conversion basis. But anyway, uh, I'd say like, we'll start there. Uh, the other thing is that maybe look at the product as lead gen as a way to experiment with PLG. So can you take some of your marketing budget instead of spending money on a Forrester study or Gartner study, could you build a sidecar product uh, that people can use for free and see how much that kind of opens up your top of funnel, brings signups, brings uh, email addresses. An example is Zenefits uh, launched, they call product snacks. So they've kind of taken parts of their product and opened it up uh, so that it's, it's public facing. And so th things like uh, health insurance marketplace. You can go search for health insurance and start to kind of find the right providers for you. And for them, the reason why they do that is they know a lot of people are searching for that specific thing. And so that's something where they can, they know that they can start to kind of bring people in and you tend to be shopping for health insurance for your business, you know, when you're early on and growing, and then you'll eventually need HR software after that. So they we're like, this is a great opportunity to kind of get people into using the Zenefits product. Uh, before we uh, overly try to kind of sell, sell them a solution. So I think th opportunities like that are really interesting ways to dip your toe into PLG. Yeah. Yeah. And I guess uh, in, in what I've seen in practice is that you never measure too many things. I mean, just try to measure everything on the, on the onboarding path to, to the usage and, and then growing the usage. And, and make sure you track all of those and, and, and look at different cohorts and look at different sources of, of, of the users coming in and how they, how they then develop, you know, develop on your platform and, and, and really, really track from the get-go because by doing that, you very quickly start seeing what works and what doesn't work. And you start seeing if something is really wrong. I mean, if there's no activations, if there's no conversion, something is really wrong. Either your value isn't there for them, or or, or something something else, and it may come to very very stupid, simple things like your your Slack example. All they ask is your email, and that's it. That's the only data point you need to give them. So don't don't overburden them about telling them telling about their themselves to you before yep. you've delivered the value, so that they're willing to do it. So. Exactly. Well, and, and I think the natural follow-up was like, like, who should do that work? And for me, it tends to be, you're looking at a product person, so a product manager who can focus on growth. They're great at customer development, taking kind of product solutions and working with the engineering team on implementing them. You want a UX person normally as well. They're going to be great at UX research and design is such a big part of getting people to see value quickly. There'll be some sort of analyst uh, resource as well to make sure that the data is set up the right way. You have the right dashboards and um, you can kind of run deep dive analysis where you need to. And then the final person would be either a product marketer or a customer success person. So at least someone that really has a lot of empathy for the customer and can hone your writing and uh, can figure out the right ways to layer in kind of CS or, or sales. Right, right. And I guess like last week we had lead feeder talking about marketing uh, where they essentially moved part of the online advertising budget into content creation because they learned that that really works and pulls in users. So also measure across the different things you do and, and shift your resources where it's, where it's really most efficient. Uh, there's actually, there's a, there's a question here on, uh, uh, what about customer-led growth versus product-led growth? Is there a difference, and how do you, how do you, how you know which should should you focus on, or 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 are they are they two sides of the of the coin? Yeah, I mean, to me, customer-led growth is kind of referring to a lot of similar concepts as as PLG. I think you know PLG is at the end of the day and an end user focused. Uh, way of growing the company. And so it's going to inherently be uh, adopting customer-led growth. So, and I think that's the, that's can be a misconception with PLG. It's, it's not like, hey, your product management team runs the company uh, and everyone's going to be product people. It's more about trying to start with this 
end user kind of focus around solving end user pain, getting them to see value quickly, bringing in sales and CS that is genuinely helpful for what they're trying to achieve. Uh, so it, it, it is essentially uh, customer led growth at the end of the day. Very good. I think we have a couple more minutes left here. Uh, maybe I'll maybe I'll ask another question here. So, how do you see open source being part of the product led growth? Is there is there special things involved, like you talked about, you know, developer centric, uh, you know, models and and developers being really kind of versed into this model? How do you position then open source? Is that just part of the free or freemium or or? Is there a difference? Yeah, I think uh, well, it's, it's super interesting because I think open source is an early kind of precursor to PLG, uh, but modern open source companies are taking a different approach than what the older ones did. So like in the old days, you would have this open source product, you'd get maybe thousands or millions of downloads of it, but you had, didn't have any data on your users who was using it, what they were doing. And your paid product was normally selling like expert services, on-prem, you know, capabilities, like support, support hosting, all that stuff. I think now we're seeing companies kind of bridge the gap, right? Where they have an open source, they have a free cloud offering that's hosted and that kind of has, uh, allows people to see value kind of more quickly, but that also gives data to the company, to the vendor around how folks are using the product. And then you also have your kind of traditional enterprise offerings. So you'll see like Elastic has their kind of pay as you go cloud products that are growing quickly. MongoDB does as well. And so to me, the big thing is make sure you have that uh, bridge where someone can go from an open source user to a free cloud user, to a paying cloud user, to, you know, if they want that enterprise uh, customer. Yeah. And I guess make sure that the value in the commercial version is really concrete high enough for the conversion to really happen at container we basically we saw users come into our free service testing the cloud version being very happy with the cloud version but being developers they defaulted back to the open source that they installed on aws on their own because the product just basically had enough value already in the open source for these guys so they also need you need to kind of i guess uh deliver enough value for the open source to be interesting, but then enough additional value yep. in, in, the, in the service product for Absolutely. the conversion to happen all the way. Yeah, and at Cypress for, in our portfolio, their open source is a test runner to go run tests in the browser really quickly as a developer, but then their cloud versions are more about a dashboard to be able to record all of your results, uh, get insights around them, collaborate with others on improving your test writing in the future. Uh, and it's, uh, it's a different kind of additional value proposition above and beyond the open source. Yeah, exactly. Very good. It's the top of the hour. And I guess we, we've handled quite a lot of questions here. So I think we're ready to close the session. Uh, Kyle, huge thanks for joining us today, presenting uh, very valuable for, for everybody involved. Uh, as, as told, the recording will be made available, slides will be, will be made available, so we can all, all uh, come back to these for, uh, for notes and, uh, and, and recaps. Uh, any final words, Kyle, from you? No, just uh, so you'll share the deck with folks and, uh, and people can also yeah, add me on LinkedIn and happy to send the deck that way. And you know, uh, we'll write a lot about PLG, so. <laughs> I definitely recommend uh, if folks are interested uh, that they that they check that out. Very good. That's it, guys. Uh, the Vendep SaaS Camp Spring 2021 is coming to an end. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. Uh, we'll post a uh, poll for you to to rate our sessions and and give us uh, uh, ideas for the for the for the upcoming sessions. Uh, and I said, you'll, you'll get the content afterwards. We'll be in touch. Thank you very much, guys. Bye.